Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about intelligent machine and augmentation. How many of you like asking tough, creative questions? Raise your hand. What if I told you that you're already active in the field of AI? What if I told you that in the future, all we'll need is, ask, is to ask hard, really tough, wicked questions and that the answers would always be there? To understand what I mean by that, we first need to go back to the founding thinkers of AI and IA, namely four people, Minsky, McCarthy, Engelbart, and Kay, then do some speculative design thinking about the future, and then land back, hopefully, with some wisdoms. But first, let's look at the basic unit of our relationship with the machine. We have a machine on one side, human on another, and there's an interaction point, an interface point. That could be your phone, a website, a kiosk, whatever, whatever it may be, some sort of interaction point. And around that, there is also, obviously, the concepts of intelligence and tools. Now, the AI way of looking at things is that you take the machine, make it intelligent, and then it comes to the human, hopefully, with useful tools and not wishes to destroy us or <laughs> anything like that. So John McCarthy, as I mentioned, started MIT's AI lab together with Marvin Minsky in 1959. And he had a lot of contributions to the field, one of which he invented Lisp, which was an AI computer language that we still use some versions of until today. He once said, you can either look at computing AI from the point of view of biology or from the point of view of computer science. You could imitate the nervous system as far as you understand the nervous system, or you could imitate human psychology as far as you understand human psychology. Marvin Minsky, his counterpart at MIT, was also a big thinker, and he was the first person to come up with a neural network simulator, means a system that's built the same way our brain is, with neural connection, all the way in 1951. And he once said, in order for a machine to be intelligent, we have to give it sev several different kinds of thinking. When it switches from one of those to another, we will say that it is changing emotions. Emotion in itself, is not a very profound thing. It's just a switch between different models of operation. So to these thinkers, and some of the thinkers today as well, our entire being with all of our ambitions and inspiration and, and the magic of being alive and human is a computer problem. It's a question of buckets of, of knowledge and equations and mathematics. The other school of thought, um, a different school of thought, is one of intelligent augmentation that believe that you can make tools smarter by uh, plugging intelligence into the machines and move the interface point closer to the human. So in essence, all it means is that the tools become uh, smarter and more intuitive, so you need to we need to stretch ourselves less in extending to the machine. Under this school of thought, the two, two main thinkers we'll talk about, Doug Engelbart and Alan Kay. Doug Engelbart is known for numerous contributions to the field, but Almost all of them were demoed in one, um, one very iconic demo, namely, aptly named the mother of all demos, where he showcased the first mouse, uh, resizable windows, teleconferencing, live, live document editing, basically everything we use today on a daily basis in Google Docs, Skype, all of those, all of those kind of tools that we use on a daily basis. And he once said, very different sentiment, the better we get at getting better, the faster we will get better. So really, you know, Engelbart's philosophy was one that if you pair a groups of intellects or people that work on a, on a challenging task and you pair them with purposeful tools, you get something that's bigger than just improvements in efficiency. And that's a very different paradigm to the one we saw before. To complement that, Alan Kay's work at Xerox Park Lab also was very versatile. He did some work on education devices, music, synthesizers, software paradigms, and, and a lot of different, very interesting stuff. But uh, to, the point, to the point of this talk, he was one of the first people to be thinking about user interface as a thing that, that, that we need to be considering. And I don't know if you know, just for context, user interface is one of the, the most prominent design fields today. And it started all the way back then. Alan Kay once said, reality is a reconstruction based on our beliefs of the world. It is that reconstruction 
that allows for theatrical performance. And it was understanding that the user interface is theater that advanced us. So Alan Kay's work really influenced generations of designers and technologists, but what really makes him stand out in this context is his ability to design tools that weren't possible at the time. So he would come up with solutions that they couldn't build yet. And the Dynabook, the Dynabook is a good example of that. It was a hybrid of a laptop and an iPad and was meant to be used as an early education device. Its software named Smalltalk it was meant to be intuitive and easy to use, just the same way all of our apps on our phones today are easy to use and, and we know what to do there. And if they're not useful, like we heard throughout the day, then they, they just failed. So what, what Alan Kay did, he invited Trig Rinkskog, who was a Finnish computer scientist. He came up with this wonderful idea of building software architecture that matches user mental models to computer operation. So this idea that you can match the way we think with the way that machine operates. And you know, that was something that philosophers and psychologists thought about a lot, this idea that motivational frameworks could be mapped to our, the way we think, to the way we, we compute the world. But there were those, those technologists had the foresight to implement that in everyday tools. So you can see on the left, we have the mental models, on the right, computer models, and in the middle, controller and view, which is essentially the tool. The modern day equivalent of that is what today we call model view controller, which is essentially a very, um, I wouldn't say basic, but procedural uh, system. You have on the left, you have a, a database computer model. On the right, you have the view, which could be an app or a website, and controllers go back and forth. You can see that the user is set firmly on the right because they, us, we, we only interact with the view. Now let's say, for example, we talk about Wikipedia. So Wikipedia, all of the entries on Wikipedia are in one huge table that sits on the left in that computer model. The Wikipedia website, that's, that's the view, that's all of those pages. Let's say you see an arrow in Wikipedia and you want to edit it, then by editing it, the controller takes your new data, goes to the computer model and propagates that. MVC was really very popular uh, from the get-go, but it really took off in the 1993 when the internet opened up. Indexable systems were the foundation to the early popularity of the internet. Now, let's think about all of the sites in the world with all of their knowledge, all of their controllers, tools, and utilities. They all confide to this structure. They're all stationary databases and proprietary interface point waiting to be accessed. If we think back a couple of hundreds of years, we first had um, the communication, we had, we had the advent of, of the information age with new communication tools, printing, etc. We later swapped hand tools to factories, and then we moved from a material economy to data economy. So it kind of makes you think, it makes you wonder, have we become too proficient in becoming efficient? Are we too efficient? Like what's, what, what, where are we going with all of this quick, quick moving around of data? Now let's run through a scenario to consider that. Let's say I want to start a business. I want to start a system, a startup. I have a tool I want to make. What should I be asking myself? I might ask myself, is my system faster and better looking than the competitions? I might ask myself, what am I protecting as a matter of business? What data should I be protecting? And I might also wonder, hopefully, if me copying all of this data all the time is actually, you know, is that being wasteful? That's, those are all questions I might consider. Now the system, as we said, my system would have its database, its view, its interface point, and sets of controllers in between. You can draw a line around it and say, that's my business. That's what I built. The same way that you think about brick and mortar shop, it's very similar. Now I want to get the users in, hopefully organically, by installing an app or signing up online. Or they could also be ushered in by marketing and, and some sort of partnerships. Now those users, whenever they want something, they'll communicate to the view, as we said, because that's the only area they have access to. But this, this paradigm is on shaky ground, and that's something we need to consider. There are a few incoming disruptions that, that really, really shuffle this whole setup. First of all, we're producing a lot more data, and in, in speed that's much greater than ever before. So soon enough, the data simply wouldn't have time to make it to a database. 
And when I say a database, I just mean the internet. So right now we're sitting here, we all have our phones, and let's say we have Apple Watches, there's data, like just like shelling off us. You know, like let's say, you know, it listens to your heart rate, you know, you're moving, how many steps you walk. Database is the, the cloud, the internet. You know, so, some, so at a certain point, it just wouldn't make it there. It's just gonna, it's gonna be too much of it, and we'll have to do something with the, this offline data. Interface points are gonna move, they're gonna be much bigger than our phone. I mean, right now when we need something, this is a window. This is a window into the internet, utilities, all of these tools. Soon enough, it's gonna be everywhere, just around us. You know, and that's, that's, we're starting to see that with the Internet of Things, but that's only going to get much bigger. So in this new reality, rather than us going and finding the utility, utility would come and find us. In whatever, whatever version the Internet takes next, you know, we're going to have to start thinking about building tools for data that's not online. And that's a very different way of thinking about it. So that makes us think, what's this new gold? So what's this controller, this thing that goes back and forth? So let's say if I, if I run, I have a running app, and, and it tracks my run, and I finished it, and now it sends it to the internet and renders it back down with some value. You ran more miles this week than last. Um, you know, you're, you got two more miles to run tomorrow, et cetera. But in this new, in this new model, we have to take that computation that happens up there, for example, calculating how fast you run a mile and the purpose that the entire system exists for and merge it into this new crystallized, highly dense, highly valuable controller. So I think that these controllers are gonna become really powerful because what we're gonna have, we're gonna have this hard function, which is literally, you ran 20 miles last week, you're running 25 this week, and the purpose, which might be if you run two more miles this week, you might be five degrees happier. So those things together could really do, um, could work on all kinds of different, different systems. And those utilities would travel because right now, as we said, our data does all of the traveling. And in the future, our utilities will do the traveling instead. Instead of you uploading your data, as we said, from your watches and phones and going online, those utilities would travel and find us. And lastly, data and interfaces would merge. You know, right now we have very clear boundaries between an app, a website, a database. And a database, it's very, you can just think about it as a table. Let's think about of a database as, as a stack of papers, and an interface would be a form. Right now, this is very clear. It's as clear of a separation as that. Whenever you want to put something in the database, you fill the form and you put it in. In the future, that's going to change, I think. Because when it comes down to it, data is pretty cheap, as we, as we learned. And tools make themselves. I mean, the, this, is, this is a machine learning tool that Airbnb uses to, uh, for dynamic pricing. So this is how they advise hosts how to price their property. So you can see a lot more tools making themselves. Kevin Kelly, who's a great writer and um, one of the founders of Wired, said in his last book um, that cognition would soon be, soon be as accessible as Amazon Web Services or electricity, and we could plug cognition right into our system. So think about that. Right now, as we said, all of those systems with pieces of paper or my running example, imagine you just plug cognition into it. So with new sensors, this kind of cognition and new paradigms, it's very likely that we'll have some form of endless knowledge. But that doesn't necessarily mean endless utility. Imagine if I give you a piece of paper, just a blank white piece of paper, and ask you to draw anything. That's simple enough. But what if I told you that that piece of paper holds all of the answers to anything you could ask? What do you draw then? I see the future as a convergence of humans and machines. Humans and machines coming closer together, communica communicating through data and intelligence, and rendering back tools of purpose and uh, function. I think that the, the future of universal interfaces will be the question. But that also makes us think, what would we ask? What do you ask if everything is possible? What do you ask if everything is known? Thank you.